It's March 17th, 1601, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. If I told you the first St. Patrick's Day parade didn't take place in Ireland, you'd probably guess it was in New York, maybe Boston, maybe even Philadelphia. You probably wouldn't guess St. Augustine, Florida, but it was indeed here, today in history, all the way back in 1601, that an Irish priest called Father Richard Arthur organised the first recorded parade in honour of St. Patrick, or as his parishioners in the Spanish colony called him, San Patricio. Yeah, it's extraordinary, isn't it? And a reminder that actually colonial America was more diverse than you might otherwise Assume you don't really think of Irishmen being in Spanish Florida. But what happened, it was exposed quite recently, was that in St. Augustine, Florida, there was a Spanish colony, but with an Irish vicar, Ricardo Artur, who was one of the first parish priests in America. And so when they were having their annual celebration of St. Augustine, uh, after whom the town was named, and putting in their order for some hefty gunpowder... uh, (laughs) They also ordered some for St. Patrick's Day. Yeah, all of this was discovered just a few years back in 2017 by a historian called J. Michael Francis. And he was looking through documents inside the reading room at the Grand Archivo General de Indias in Seville in Spain. And he just found this document that read, They processed through the streets of St. Augustine and the cannon fired from the fort. And according to Francis, the marchers likely would have carried an image of the saint and celebrated with food and drink and music. And the document was named St. Patrick, the protector of the city's maize fields. So it has this crazy Mm. coming together of this Irish saint who's being declared the patron protector of a new world crop corn in a Spanish garrison settlement in Florida. It's just the most sort of (laughs) bonkers coming together of of different things. Clever priest, though, isn't it? Like if you're going to try and get the locals to embrace your patron saint, you know, make him the saint of corn yeah. their main crop like then they're on board with it right he's like what's all around this settlement yeah. <laughs> yeah it's that i mean this was definitely all coming from arthur he was a former soldier he was from limerick originally he arrived in the colony in 1597 by 1600 the feast of san patricio was being marked with a gunfire salute and the following year by a parade and it must have been pretty much a one-man effort there was hardly a thriving expat community J. Michael Francis did find mention of just one other Irish resident, a guy called Darby Glavin, whom the Spanish, obviously not a very common name for them. They referred to him in their records either as David Glavid or as Davy Glavy, which makes me feel like Richard Arthur got off pretty easily by the fact that they just referred to him by a Spanish name, Ricardo Artur. <laughs> I mean, the fact that this wasn't uncovered until quite recently does speak to the fact that the most significant... St. Paddy's Day parades were the ones that did indeed happen in Boston and in New York City about 100 years later, 1737 and 1762, respectively. And those were homesick Irish soldiers serving in the English military, marching through American cities. And that's what sprang about the St. Paddy's Day celebrations as Americans know them now, with all kinds of things that aren't authentically Irish. I mean, I think most Americans listening to this probably will know that green beer is something that they invented and green bagels. I mean, that's clearly something that's not come from Ireland. But perhaps more surprisingly to some even Irish Americans is that there are things that are taken in New York's St. Paddy's Day parades that only happen there. So, for example, corned beef and cabbage is seen by New Yorkers as a quintessential Mm. Irish dish. But actually it came from New York Irish migrants who couldn't afford bacon substituting it with beef brisket from Jewish delis. That's why it's in New York. It's not an Irish thing at all. And in Ireland, you didn't get a St. Patrick's Day parade until 1903 and didn't really become a commercial holiday until the 1980s. Yeah, I mean, the sort of celebratory St. Patrick's Day parades we all picture now certainly didn't arise from Ireland. You know, it was primarily a religious commemoration. And through much of Ireland's history, the, you know, the government has been very tightly enmeshed with the church. And St. Patrick's Day usually falls right in the middle of Lent. So there was certainly no culture of feasting and drinking and partying. In fact, between 1922 and 1973, pubs in Ireland weren't even allowed to open on St. Patrick's Day. I mean, there are some authentic Irish traditions associated with the day, but they were pretty muted, to be honest, you know, where 
wearing a fabric badge with a cross on it, wearing shamrocks. I found an amazing article in People magazine that was debunking the myths about St. Patrick's Day. And I just really have to read you its opening two paragraphs. It said, did you know that wearing head to toe green and drinking Guinness actually have nothing to do with the real St. Patrick? Even more surprising, (laughs) St. Patrick isn't even his real name. Here are eight St. Patrick's Day facts that it'll have you saying, I wish I knew that sooner. (laughs) Oh, that's good. I mean, the fact that we're still talking about him at all shows that he was a successful missionary, I feel we should say, in a history (laughs) podcast. You know, think about St. Francis of Assisi, who we were talking about a few weeks ago. He didn't actually manage to convert that many people overseas. Patrick began his mission to Ireland in 432, and by his death in 461, the island of Ireland was almost entirely Christian. Mm. Yeah, and prior to J. Michael Francis' discovery, it was believed the oldest US celebration of St. Patrick took place in the more expected location of Boston in 1737, when the members of the new charitable Irish society held a St. Patrick's Day dinner. And it just really underscores the fact that the history of the parade is so full of contradictions. You know, the first one was in Florida. The one that was previously thought to be the oldest one in Boston was actually carried out by a Northern Irish Charitable Association. You know, prior to the mid 1800s, most immigrants to America from Ireland were Northern Irish Protestants. And the famous New York City one, as you mentioned, Ollie, was started by soldiers serving in the British Army, albeit Irish ones. Yeah, the fact that it only became official in 1848 in New York, at least, when uh, the New York Irish Aid Societies decided to come together and unite their parades to form one official New York. City St. Patrick's Day Parade really speaks to this kind of slow, long-form genesis that took place in different pockets of the world with different pieces of mythology and iconography being stripped from various places and then united into this slightly unholy uh, amalgam. But today the parade in New York is the world's oldest civilian parade and the largest in the United States. Apparently 150,000 people take part in it every year. It's huge. And what's interesting is how, as with so many things, the kind of Americanized version of the thing has become the global thing, mm. even in places like Ireland and Britain, where it's ostensibly from. Um, you know, you look back at the original Irish St. Patrick's Day parades, and they were often being used, understandably, to protest against British rule, sometimes violently. Mm. Uh, in 1916, the police force recorded 38 separate processions organized by nationalist groups involving 5,995 marchers, just under half of whom were reportedly armed. And then, you know, you look at how it's celebrated here in London, and again, understandably, people were cautious that they didn't want to kick off a political event whilst allowing Irish people to celebrate being Irish. So there were very low-key parades in London until really like the noughties. Well, I mean, even now, you know, the anti-English sentiment is still there. In the in the 2023 guidelines for marching in the St. Patrick's Day Parade in New York City, it is specified, point number four, the only banners allowed are ones identifying the unit or England get out of Ireland. No exceptions. Wow. Wow, yeah. <laughs> I mean, one of the most interesting international Paddy's parades is in Montserrat. Have you seen that? Mm-hmm. The, the British no. Overseas Territory in the Caribbean. They have a national holiday for St. Patrick's Day there uh, with festivities that last over a week. And again, to speak to the sort of complexity of this, that's partly because of the influence of Irish people on Montserrat because they were deported there during Cromwell's reign. It's partly to commemorate the African slaves who led a failed rebellion against plantation owners there, some of whom were Irish, on St. Patrick's Day in 1768. Mm. So it's a really odd commemoration, really, that they're taking part in. But now it's become this sort of mashed up Caribbean Irish festivity. And maybe it's easy to do this kind of superimposition of your own uh, interpretation of what St. Patrick's Day and parades are meant to be about because St. Patrick himself is so very much famed for things that he maybe probably didn't do, like the idea that he banished snakes from Ireland, which... (laughs) I haven't seen any snakes there lately. Well, that's true. Uh, But, you know, fossil records seem to have suggested that maybe there were never (laughs) any snakes. (laughs) can banish the fossils as well. <laughs> Could have done, I suppose. <laughs> um, but also there was this idea that he uh, used the shamrock as a, ch- a teaching tool with each of the three leaves of the clover representing the Holy Trinity, the Father, Son and Holy Spirit, which is also probably not true that the clover plant was sacred to Irish dru- druids and the number three was also sacred to Irish druids. And so that's probably where that coming together. So, yeah, I mean, maybe it's to do with the relatability of some 
Patrick's. It's probably more to do with the availability of Guinness, I dare yeah, say. Yeah. <laughs> I think once you've had a few drinks, you're willing to celebrate Paddy's wherever you are. Yeah. seems to be what's happening. And so another week of retrospecting ends. But next week begins a day early at Club Retrospectors. Join us now to get an exclusive episode every Sunday. Patreon.com slash Retrospectors. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.